Hey, this video is a kind of a continuation of of my other, not my last video that I just made um, through Video Animaker, but uh, the 7,000 year plan. I wanted to read something from it because I don't know how many people actually clicked on it, but it's so interesting. Listen to what it says. At the end of this video, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to be doing with my new... Um, with new videos that I'm making and that last thing that I made there um, like I'm just that's just messing around that's promoting my my book um, but I'm just learning how to use that software and uh, and I have to pay to get most of its good benefits but it's still good so all right so this is from that 7,000 year plan these are weird things that happened um, <clears throat> after Jesus' death. And you, you can't refute these things. These things were written down by the Jews themselves, right? They're the ones who don't believe in Jesus, so, so why would they say these things? So I'm going to read a, a few things. Destruction of the temple. The fulfillment of Jesus Christ's prophecy concerning the destruction of the temple, Matthew 24 and Luke 21, of the magna magnificent temple at Jerusalem reveals the year of Jesus Christ's crucifixion. So Herod the Great uh, in 40 B BC, the Roman Senate appointed Herod, later known as Herod the Great, as the ruler of Judea. Herod had previously served as the, as the governor of Galilee and was a personal friend of Mark Antony before Antony became defeated by Octavian. That's after Caesar died, after they killed um, Caesar. Later, Herod became a friend of Octavian, who became the first Roman emperor as Caesar Augustus. Herod the Great ruled Judea for the next 36 years, uh, during which time he began many huge building projects, <clears throat> including the building of a... There goes my, my voice, goes, I don't know when it's going to go. Um, I have dysphonia of my throat, so... Um, including the building of a new temple in Jerusalem for the worship of God. From the beginning of the temple project in 19 before Christ, it took 46 years to complete, 46 years, the main building, and another 36 years to finish the entire complex, temple complex. That's a long time. So that was a huge undertaking, undertaking which required a tremendous amount of labor and money. This new temple was said to be a larger or more beautiful temple than that Solomon built. That says a lot, doesn't it? So when the when the apostles ask uh, Jesus, you know, when is the end times going to be? When they ask that, they're on you know on the Mount of Olives and they're looking at the temple. Um, the historian Josephus. I'm going to give you some really cool stuff here in a second said that much of the exterior of the temple was covered with gold. Imagine that, like a huge temple that reflected the fiery rays of the sun. Moreover, he said that from a distance, the temple appeared like a mountain covered with snow. This was probably because those parts were not covered with gold that were, ma uh, were made of white stone. White stone, expensive. That temple, by the way, wasn't made with any loud tools or anything. It, it, it was all put together. There was no hammering. There was no anything like that. That was when Solomon did anyways. Um, from what it said in many writings about Herod's temple, it was indeed a magnificent structure of awesome proportions. However, four years after its completion, it was totally destroyed and wiped from the face of the earth. During Jesus' time, many of the Jews were so awestruck and impressed with grandeur of the temple that they replaced the worship of God with respect and reverence for the temple complex itself. That's why idols need to be destroyed, and that's exactly what God did. Um, the Passover season of 30 AD began much as it had in previous years. Thousands of pilgrims from all over the world crowded into Jerusalem. Because they were concerned with uh, preparing for the Passover, they didn't realize that this particular Passover would be the most important event in all of human history. It was on this Passover that the Lamb of God would be sacrificed for the sins of humanity. So a lot of people 
go to Jerusalem for the for the Passover and for all these festivals. Give me a second. So I'm going to read you these crazy events that are you can't refute. Because they're in the records. Significance events at the crucifixion. Jesus died at about 3 p.m. on Friday afternoon of 30 A.D. on the first of two authorized Passover ceremonies. His death set into motion a series of events and warnings to the Jews, which were meant to show that indeed the Jews had murdered the Messiah and that his prophecy concerning the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem would come to pass. So there's one prophecy, right, that he got right pretty quickly. Um, there were three simultaneous events that happened during the earthquake at Jesus' death and are of major importance to the fulfillment of the prophecies concerning the destruction of the temple at Jerusalem. <coughs> Number one, the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom. So you don't hear a lot about that, do you? You know, when you read it and you see it in the movies, but where's the proof? So... So I'm going to give it. The tomb opened and the dead raised to life. Number two. Number three, Jesus acknowledged as the son of God. So the temple curtains. History seems to indicate that there were two curtains in Herod's temple. One as the, um, at the huge gated entry into the temple and the other separating the Holy of Holies and the main sanctuary. These curtains were said to be 60 feet long, 30 feet wide, as thick as the palm of a man's hand. Think about that. They're pretty thick. That's very thick, very hard to tear. Uh, we're told that these curtains were so heavy that 300 priests, 300 priests, uh, were needed to manipulate each one. The curtain being torn from top to bottom was a foreboding omen, indicating that God's hand had torn it in two and that his presence was leaving that holy place. See, and so it says in brackets, see the Jewish Talmud, the Yoma 39b. So that's, this is the proof. Excuse me. This resurrection of the dead shows the following. Christ's blood is life-giving, pictured in the blood of the Passover lamb, and has now wiped away the penalty of sins for all those who only had their sins covered by the sacrifice of animals. There will be a time when all those who have or will have lived a righteous life will be given eternal and immortal life at the return of Christ. Guys, come to Christ now. I'm telling you, the world is dying very, very quickly. All you have to do is believe in the name of Jesus Christ. That's it. You have to believe what he did. That's it. That's all that's required. But if you ask me, in my view, your life should also reflect that because because once you start believing in him, then you start to see all what's wrong with the world. But that's all that's necessary. I can't say that enough, man. You think of you know, like your family going to hell. There's only two places people go, okay? I don't mean to scare people, but when you see prophecies being fulfilled in front of your eyes and you know where to read them from, you don't read them from the Quran, even though that was, in my opinion, that was much a copy of the Bible because it came after the Bible and it started repeating a lot of the things. You don't see it in all other writings. This is this is the truth, the way, the life. So, the great enemy, death, has lost its power over humanity through the sacrificial blood of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> I'm going to get to a really cool one here. The unusual events that happened after. The Jews had rejected Jesus Christ as the Messiah and murdered him as their fathers had murdered many others whom God had sent them to teach them his laws and way of life. God had enough. To their shame, it was a Roman centurion, not an Israelite, 
who recognized and acknowledged Jesus as the Son of God beside the cross. Because of their rejection of the Messiah and his message, the Jews would now have to pay a heavy price. The magnificent st structure which symbolized God's presence and on which the Jewish Jews lavished much praise and showed great reverence would be destroyed along with their beloved city. Give me a second. The next one here is really cool. The next three are really cool. unusual events of 30 AD so 30 AD Jesus died <clears throat> my voice is just so bad so rough so these are the things that happened like him after his death so the Bible records several remarkable events that occurred at the time when Jesus was crucified example an er a great earthquake rock split the temple veil was torn from top to bottom not bottom to top top to bottom tombs opened and dead saints resurrected however what what's interesting is that historians also record several strange events in the year 30 AD says the Jewish Talmud in, in Yoma 39b of the events which occurred in 30 AD 40 years before the temple was destroyed 40 years before It says in brackets, example, 40 years before 70 AD, or in 30 AD, the gates of the Hekel, the holy place, so that's 30 AD, opened by themselves until Rabbi Yohanan B. Zakai rebuked them. He rebuked the gates, saying, Hekel, Hekel, why alarmest uh, thou us we know thou art destined to be destroyed <clears throat> that's what he said for the huge doors of the temple behind the veil to open of their own accord or in association with the great earthquake would cause them to pull powerfully against the veil and with the uh, lintel falling at the same time it would it, it could have torn it from top to bottom not bottom to top so if it's if it if it tears from bottom to top, it could look human, but from top to bottom, it would be God, because it's so tall. No one could go up there and do that. The Sanhedrin says the Talmud, forty years before the destruction of the temple, the Sanhedrin was banished from the chamber of hewn stone and sat in the tradition chamber on the Temple Mount, the Shabbat 15a. The Sanhedrin officiated from the chamber of hewn stones, which was about 120 uh, feet southeast of the temple and it's a normal stone lintel, which was at least 30 feet long, weighing 30 tons and had cracked during the earthquake at the Messiah's death. History tells us that the Sanhedrin moved from their opulent surroundings in the chamber of hewn stones to lesser, accommodate, uh, to, to lesser accommodations shortly after the earthquake because there's no record of the Sanhedrin being forced by the Romans to move from the temple, uh, which would have caused a major political crisis. One can assume that the Sanhedrin moved because the earthquake had so badly damaged the building and it was unsafe for them to continue to meet there. So here's the proof that people need about the things that happened, the earthquake, the tearing. Listen to this one. This, I was just going to make this video about just this. <clears throat> it's called the Black Stone. This one is freaky. 
This is the kind of stuff that just makes you believe even more. So this has in brackets, quotations, And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. Leviticus 16.8, King James Version. There is much debate over exactly what kind of objects the lots were. However, the information found in the Babylonian Talmud and the, and the Mishnah indicates that the lots were two stones, one white and one black. The white stone had the words, For the Lord, written on it. And the black stone had the words, For Azazel, i.e. the goat that is sent away or banished. So the first one, the, the white stone says for the Lord, and the black stone says the goat that is sent away or banished. <coughs> this is brutal. These two stones were placed into a container, and it was shaken, so craps, right? Then, without looking into the container, the high priest would put his right hand into the container and draw out one of the lots. The Babylonian Talmud shows that for 200 years before Christ's death in 30 AD, the first stone to appear in the right hand of the priest randomly fluctuated each year for between the white and black for 200 years. One would expect this type of randomness because God selected the more perfect goat to be slain for the sins of the people. Uh, but beginning with the Day of Atonement and 30 after death, the year of the death and resurrection of Christ, the black stone appeared in the right hand of the high priest for the next 39 years. Think about that. So for the next 39 years, appeared in his hand, um... What did it say here? The goat that is sent away or banished. That's exactly what happened. Um, the chances of the black stone for Azazel appearing 40 consecutive times in the right hand of the priest is over one in a trillion. According to Pascal's table of numerical odds, the continual appearance of the black stone on the right hand of the high priest uh, was surely a sign of God's displeasure with the house of Judah and a warning for them to repent. The fulfillment of the prophetic black stone came after 40 years. What happened, I remember I said 39 years, right? It happened for 39 years from 30 AD to 70 AD when they were destroyed. Crazy. Um, after the continuous warning when the temple in Jerusalem were destroyed in 70 AD by the Roman Empire. I'll just read a bit more here. And, uh, the more I talk, the more I get gastritis in my stomach. It hurts. So I got to eat. The Scarlet Thread. On the Day of Atonement, a scarlet wool thread was placed on the door of the sanctuary. It was said that this thread turned white when the live goat was set free. But beginning on the Day of Atonement in 30 AD, this thread never turned white again. See Yoma 39b, Babylonian Talmud, and pages 166, 170, Mishnah, Mishnah by Danby. So this person is citing all these things. Clearly the failure of the scarlet thread to turn white was another sign of God's disapproval of Israel's worship of him and their impending punishment if they didn't repent. God really left the Jews, not for good, but he left them till 1948. He left them for a long time. They killed all the prophets that came that told them to repent. Sometimes they did, but most times they didn't. And uh, so because of Adam's sin, Jesus had to pay that price. 
the only way to it was the only way to save Oz and he did that and it, and he came as a human being and God incarnate and and the Jews refused him um, okay I'll, I'll see I'll read this last thing I'm going to read. I just want to check my time here. <clears throat> Final warning to the Jews. In 66 AD, just three and a half years prior to the siege of Jerusalem and the destruction of Herod's temple and the Jewish historian Josephus recorded several dramatic events and warnings that concerned uh, the temple worship at Jerusalem. Uh, the war book uh, 6 chapter 5 and foretold the end of the temple worship system at Jerusalem the following are just a few of the many warnings of impending disaster to come upon Jerusalem during the feast of unleavened bread in 66 AD um, three and a half years prior to the destruction of t the temple at about three o'clock in the morning a light as bright as daylight appeared around the altar for for a half an hour Although some thought it was a good sign, the scribes understood it to be a precursor to the supernatural events that followed during the feast. A heifer, being led for sacrifice, was said to have given birth to a lamb. I don't know. A heifer. A heifer is, I think, a female red cow. I don't know if it has to be red, but... Um, there's a lot of the, the, a red heifer right now talking Israel. So it's said to have given birth to a lamb in the midst of the temple. Around midnight during the feast, the huge eastern gates of the inner court of the temple, which was made of brass and normally took 20 men to shut, opened on its own. Josephus says that this was understood by knowledgeable men to mean that the temple's protection had vanished and that the gate was open for their benefit for the benefit of their enemies. These enlightened men publicly declared that this sign foreshadowed the disaster that was coming on them. So those are likely from people who, who knew about that and then says this stuff after the destruction of the temple. It's kind of hard, right, not to, not to see that. On the 21st of the, of the month of E-R, E-R, I-Y-A-R, just before sunset, chariots, chariots and soldiers in armor were seen running around in the clouds around the city and it also says for that see Luke 21 20 I went to it and it actually kind of it could be uh, pertaining to that Luke 21 20 during the night portion of the day of Pentecost in 20 or sorry in 66 AD as the priests were entering the inner court of the temple they felt a quaking and heard a great noise and a sound like a great multitude of voices saying, let us remove hence. Jewish historical records state that the uh, Shekinah glory, the Shekinah glory departed the temple at that time and remained over the Mount of Olives for three and a half years, during which time a voice could sometimes be heard coming from the Mount pleading for the Jews to repent. God gives people so much time to, to, do, to repent and do things like that, which I think God is judging America right now, the United States especially. Um, I live in Canada. I can see it happening. And there's plenty of time to repent for all, all the bad. I think they're Babylon. But anyway, that's my opinion. See Midrash Lamentations uh, 2 verse 11. It said that just before the Romans' final siege of Jerusalem, that this light, which appeared over the Mount of Olives for three and a half years, disappeared into the heavens. The Jews failed to heed these and many other warnings to repent of their sins and return uh, to their God in humble obedience. If indeed the nation of Israel began its covenant relationship with the Creator God on the day of Pentecost at the foot of Mount Sinai, it ended this relationship on the day of Pentecost in 66 AD. 
God has a timeline. God has a perfect timeline. Like I said in my other videos, you know, I said a million geniuses. It would take a billion geniuses. No one could make the Bible and uh, intertwine all the verses the way. Sorry, I got to give my voice a break. Give me a sec. The impossibilities of the Bible, the improbabilities of the Bible are, are just insane. You would have to read all of the New Testament to understand that, and you would have to read a number of books from the Old Testament to come to that conclusion. And then you can, you know, do cross-referencing on, on search engines, on Google, whatever search engine. And you'll find and you'll be like, okay, this is talking about this, this is this. Oh, that refers back to that. Um, so. So not in my last video that I that I did um, in my Animaker thing, but the one before that, the 7,000 year period. Uh, follow my instructions to get to that on this website. Bible in song. So you go to, um, what was it? You go to Bible commentary, go down to Revelations, click Revelations, then go on the left, very left side, uh, look down in the, in the third box, and you'll see, does God have a 7,000 year plan? Uh, it's probably about 10 pages long or more but it's worth reading anyways. Um, it explains a lot. So that's for... Oh, man, my stomach. So that's for that part of it. Um, <clears throat> so you can see the video I made in the last one about my book. I'm going to try to make... Uh, and I, and I believe I'm going to do World War II, like heroes, certain battles, um, not super long videos or anything. But um, like I said, I have another channel. And I started doing stuff uh, a couple of years ago, but I just stopped. And, uh, and I have to pay like $20 a month for, for its full benefits, which I haven't done yet. So I want to try to learn how to make the best videos possible and uh and do that and see i'm not going to put my face in it i'm not going to put my voice in it start a whole new channel um or just make my other channel just just change it but i uh, just want to make it the best i can um i can't really work outside my outside my home because of my conditions and so i have to find things to do and and uh, besides selling candles, but oh, my next video, by the way, and I'll put it on this channel. It's going to be all my candles. I'm going to show you all my candles. Uh, it's, it shows them on the screen for like 10 seconds each one, uh, with their prices um, and a voice. So you'll see. Um, it's good, you know, when people ask me, you know, what kind of candles do you have? I have a document I give people with with the list and prices and pictures. But it'd be nice to, to be able to go back to my YouTube channel and just share it in a video. It's much easier that way. Uh, so for the World War II stuff, I'm just going to find the best stories. And uh, so this time, I'm going to try to get as many subs as I can. That's my goal. Because if I get over a 1,000 subs, which might take some time, I have to make some good content. I'm going to take my time. Um, then I can monetize it and uh, hopefully make some money. So, thanks for watching this video. Read that. It's so, so very interesting. And like I said in my other video, um, discernment. If you don't believe me, what I say in my videos, go look, go look it up. Um, this is a very good website. I'll leave it again. Uh, I'm going to leave, leave also a link for my book, too. Um, 
what else was I gonna say? Yeah, I do have something else to say. I know I say this. Um, now is the time to change your life. I know a lot of uh, people, I don't get a lot of views on my thing, but the, the people that do watch my videos, uh, a lot of them are sick people. People who are sick and pain and mental illness, who knows, autism. And uh, if you're stuck, like I was, like back when I was younger, you know, um, because of social problems that I didn't know existed. Like I did, I knew they existed. I just didn't, I just didn't know it was autism. I didn't know there were other mental health disorders. I chose to to drink and do drugs and uh, addicted to uh, sex and porn and um, I got in trouble when I was younger. And I'm telling you, uh, and, and you know, my other video, I said, you know, you get. You watch TV all day, like that's what people do. This is what most people do. They sit, they play video games. Nothing wrong with playing video games, but if you're over like a certain amount of time, do you go out? Do you go for walks? Do you do, you do anything else but keep your head buried in these things? Um, my point is with all those things, can you find, can you ever find uh, that you're filled? Like, like, oh, that game was awesome. I don't ever have to, um, keep going back to it or to another porn site, you know, you look at one porn site and you're like, okay, that's enough. I've, I've seen it then, you know? <laughs> um, and so it, the message is so much more urgent when I'm telling you, it could be 2023 that, that Jesus raptures the, tr the true believers, just the people who believe in him, um, and try to change their life. And all that information is in the Bible. I understand when, when you first start and you read the Bible, you know, you start yawning, you start, but I'm telling you, it picks up, it gets better. And uh, what I see in the world, it's all converging. All the signs are here, guys. I wouldn't tell you anything other than the truth of what I, of what I thought, what I've heard, what I can see in the news. It's insane. People are being arrested now for, for praying at abortion clinics. So a persecution of Christians has already been going on. I think 5,000 die a year or something, but mostly in not countries like Canada and the States and, and Europe, but it's coming. The people who are not raptured, who refused to believe, the only way to, to come to God is to have your head cut off. You'll have your head cut off your faith. That's what it says will happen in the Bible. You'll be beheaded. Um, or you take the mark of the beast. If you don't take the mark of the beast, you'll be beheaded. And that's your way to heaven. Um, so I think about that. Jesus Christ is coming back very soon, guys.